what's going on, my my ninjas and my nincompoops. All right, y'all. So here's the deal. I'm going to read another chapter of Stephen King's The Stand. I'm going through this now. It's a great, great, great uh, epidemic reading. If you ever wanted to read something during an epidemic, this is what you want to be reading. So The Stand, again, uh, I suggest everybody read this book. It's I just found out today that Stephen King was on booze and cocaine. Speaking of, I mean, I think it's a good cautionary tale. Let me get a glass of wine here because booze does kind of loosen me up a little bit. I can see why some artists experiment with it. Uh, because it makes you less self less self-conscious. And so if you ever listen to uh, there we go, hold on, I'm trying to find some uh, Turn about a wine glass. If you ever, um, uh, what's a good, uh, I'm trying to think of an art. It's not Rothko. There's another artist I'm trying to think of that actually experimented with booze. Uh, Andy Dick, he was a comedian that actually experimented with booze when he was doing stand-up comedy. It's a little bit dangerous, though, because, I mean, it can go off the rails if you're not careful. And so... A lot of these artists, a lot of these authors that actually have used this stuff over time, uh, you can abuse it. It can become a, a more trouble than it's worth, but a glass of wine here and there. That certainly can't hurt. All right, so um, let me get a glass of water here. See, I'm conscientious about my health. And they call it self-medication, I believe. Trying to find a way to change your mental state. Sometimes drugs is the only thing that does it, to be honest. <clears throat> Chapter 20 of The Stand, the Harborside was the oldest hotel in Ogonquit. Now, I want to do something. I'm going to have to watch this to get this accent right. So this isn't going to be the best southern Maine accent. But I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. Let me actually listen to a few people, like an actual, because it's exaggerated, right? Like even people from Chicago, you can turn on like a really thick Chicago accent, but you know, the more you do it, like if you actually talk to actual people, talk like that, they don't talk like that the whole time. Although you, you can find some people in Chicago that absolutely sound like that. So some people have thicker accents than others. Um, when you're doing an audiobook, so I'm not a professional audiobook reader by any stretch, but they often change their accents all the time. So I listen to one uh, that's uh, a good show, by the way, on Netflix. If you want to watch it, it's actually called um, It is the Lords of the North. This is the Northern. I mean, if you're from the North of England, you're just going to rip me apart. But this is what it's like uh, Sean Bean from, from Game of Thrones, Winter is Coming. So, uh, who wrote The Lords of the North? Lords of the North. Good book, by the way. Lords of the North, Bernard Cornwell. And so, um, that, is, that was actually how I got turned on to these books was the, he wrote the Saxon Chronicles. Uh, Bernard Cornwell, uh, English author of historical novel, The History of the Waterloo Campaign. So apparently he's done a few historical novels. Uh, guy's 76. He's still kicking, as far as I know. And the Last Kingdom, that's the name of the series that is on um, that's on Netflix. And it is very, very, very good. Um, my mom said that the, the guy who plays Utreb reminds her of her her brother, who was very da a very dashing figure. So I recommend it. Let me hear this accent. Let's get I wanna I wanna do like a Southern Maine accent, or a Mainer accent, a Maine accent. Here you go, Mana. Sounds like this to me. Hi, I'm Ryan, and I decided that I, I guarantee you this is the best time you've ever heard a Maine accent. Mana's mouth. True. Downies. Hmm. So what you want to focus on is people from Maine don't really say ours. I think 
ah instead of r non rhotic in england hard move the car move the car you can't get that from here no i'm sorry bob you can car move the car Shing. I watched him sing the entire thing. Ah. Uh -huh. So there's an old SNL sketch where it's you can't get there from here. No, I'm sorry, Bob, you can. So I'm just going to go with it. I mean, I generally know what the accent is, but I'm going to try and do a Mainer accent for this one. Uh, Stephen King is from Maine. And uh, the voiceover artist who actually did the version of the stand that I'm reading, which I think is the uh, the standard one actually uses a Mainer accent. The, the car, well, you, you can't get there. So if you see me trying to like play with it, uh, if I was an actual voiceover artist, but I've done some voiceover work, but it's been a while, um, I'd probably play with it to see what they wanted. So the, the problem with any accent that you try and do, there's no one accent. Even if, you know, if I start doing a standard Chicago accent like this, you know, I mean, that's what a cap from down on the south side is going to sound like. And he's going to probably be a white guy, but a black guy ain't going to talk like that. And so, you know, it's it's sort of a it, it becomes a caricature almost of how a person actually talks. And no one's no even if you're from Dublin, Ireland, no one's going to have an exact Dubliner accent. And by the way, this is me just kind of moving in and out of character. So I can't. I can't authoritatively say that this is right, this is wrong, but I think as long as you you get in a character and you start feeling the character out, like even you know a guy like me who grew up in Texas, if you're talking to somebody who is educated, it, it doesn't matter if they grew up in the sticks. If they go to college, they're going to start realizing what you would call standard American dialect or sad, just like there's a standard British dialect and so uh, standard American dialect. So standard American dialect is going to be um, the, the what you would hear on the news. Welcome to News of Six. My name is John. Top story tonight is a giant feather duster flew over Manhattan and killed 18 people, more at 11. So that is a standard American accent. So even though I speak standard American English, you know, I can start going full Tennessee if y'all want, y'all go full redneck. And so accents are kind of just ways to color a character in a way so that you hear him in a different way. And so I can't speak authoritatively. You know, you have people show up out of the woodwork and say, that's not how the accent is. It's like, dude, even per a person with a, a hardcore Philly accent, which I can't even totally do exactly. Um, it, people, even in Philadelphia are going to say, well, they don't talk like that. They talk like this. I mean, it really depends. And so I've talked to people and this, this is where people say I can turn the accent on or off, right? You're speaking a dialect. And so in the United States, we don't have dialects like they do in, say, Italy, for example. So if you go to Italy, they'll say dialetto. The, and the, the standard dialect in Italy is the, is the Tuscan dialect, the dialect if you take an Italian class right now. That was the dialect that about 1880s, if I have that right, was made the you know, universal dialect for Italy. So we don't really have that in English. I mean, if you go to England, there's Manish, there's, there's different, there's Cornish. Uh, Welsh, but even those, you know, for it's just really odd when you go to Italy and in each of their regions have their own dialect. And they'll say, I had a friend Davide who would say, my, my friends and I speak this dialect. My parents speak that dialect. I go, do you speak your, da your dad's dialect? No, he doesn't. And it sounds completely different. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a way of identity. It's, and so when you're around somebody from Philly and if you're from Philly and you start talking a little bit like that, it's kind of a way to say, I belong in a way. So I'm going to read these with some uh, dialects from Maine. If if you're from Maine and think it's fucking wrong, then you say so in the comments section. But chapter 20, I thought was beautiful. Um, I'm going through the stand here and I'm just picking out chapters that I think are especially powerful. As I said at the beginning of this video, uh, Stephen King wrote this book on Coke and on a lot of booze. I'm, I, I've done Coke maybe one time and I was just you know, the great thing about Coke, it makes you want more Coke. It was the shittiest drug I've ever had in my entire life. There was nothing instructive 
nothing enjoyable. It seemed to make my nose drip and I went, why the fuck do people even do this? But Stephen King in the 1980s did a lot of coke and um, uh, had, they had an intervention, I think about 1989, where he was, you know, his blood coming out of his nose and he, his wife luckily didn't leave him and helped him get clean. And then he said he had to start writing again without being on the drugs. And he said at first he couldn't even write a sentence. So anyway, here we go. Chapter 20 of The Stand. Um, if I find it pertinent, I'll switch back and give you a little context here and there. So hopefully I'll, hopefully, you'll know when I'm being me and when I'm being the narrator. The narrator, in my mind, sounds like this. The Harborside was the oldest hotel in Agonquit. The view was not so good since they, they had built the new yacht club over on the other side. But on an afternoon like this, when the sky had been poxed with intermittent thunderstorms, the view was good enough. Franny had been sitting by the window for almost three hours, trying to write a letter to Grace Duggan, a high school chum who was now going to Smith. It wasn't a confessional letter dealing with her pregnancy or the scene with her mother. Writing about those things would do nothing but depress her, and she supposed Grace would hear soon enough from her own sources in town. She had only been trying to write a friendly letter. The bicycle trip Jesse and I took to Rangley in May with Sam Lothrop and Sally Wenselis. The biology final I lucked out on. Peggy Tates, another high school friend and mutual acquaintance, new job as a Senate page. The impending marriage of Amy Lauder. The letter just wouldn't allow itself to be written. The interesting pyrotechnics of the day had played a part. How could you write while pocket thunderstorms kept coming and going over the water? More to the point, none of the news in the letter seemed precisely honest. It had twisted slightly, like a knife in the hand that gives you a superficial cut instead of peeling the potato as you had expected it to do. The bicycle trip had been jolly, but she and Jess were no longer on such jolly terms. She had indeed lucked out on her BY7 final, but had not been lucky at all on the biology final that really counted. Neither he, neither she nor Grace had ever cared all that much for Peggy Tate, and Amy's forthcoming nuptials in Fran's present state seemed more like one of those ghastly sick jokes that an occasion of... Uh, seemed like one of those ghastly sick jokes than an occasion of joy. Amy's getting married, but I'm having the baby. Ha ha ha. Feeling that the letter had to be finished, if only so she wouldn't have to wrestle with it anymore, she wrote, I've got problems of my own. Boy, do I have problems, but I just don't have the heart to write them all down. Bad enough just having to think about them. But I expect to see you by the 4th. Unless your plans have changed since your last letter. One letter in six weeks? I was beginning to think someone had chopped your typing fingers off, kid. When I see you, I'll tell you all. I sure could use your advice. Believe in me, and I'll believe in you. Fran. She signed her name with her customary flamboyant comic scrawl, so it took up half the remaining white space on the note sheet. Just doing that made her feel more like an imposter than ever. She folded it into the envelope and addressed it and put it against the mirror standing up. Finish business. There. Now what? The day was darkening again. <clears throat> she got up and walked restlessly around the room, thinking she ought to go out before it started to rain again. But where was there to go? A movie? She'd seen the only one in town, with Jesse. To Portland, to look at clothes? No fun. The only clothes she could look at realistically these days were the ones with the elastic waistbands, room for two. She'd had three calls today. The first one, good news. The second one, indifferent. The third, bad. She wished, she wished they'd come in reverse order. Outside, the rain had begun to fall, darkening the marina's pier again. She decided she'd go out and walk into hell with the impending rain. The fresh air, the summer damp might make her feel better. She might even stop somewhere and have a glass of beer, happiness in a bottle, equilibrium, anyway. The first call had been from Debbie Smith in Summersworth. Fran was more than welcome, Debbie said warmly. In fact, if in fact she was needed. On <clears throat> one of the three girls who had been sharing the apartment who'd moved out in May, had gotten a job in a warehousing firm as a secretary. She and Rhoda couldn't swing the rent much longer without a third. 
And we're both coming from big families, Debbie said. Crying babies don't bother us. Fran said she'd be ready to move in by the 1st of July. And when she hung up, she found warm tears coursing down her cheeks, relief tears. If she could get away from this town where she had grown up, she thought she would be all right. Away from her mother, away from her father even. The fact of the baby and her singleness would then assume some sort of sane proportion in her life. A large factor, surely, but not the only one. There was some sort of animal, a bug or a frog, she thought, that swelled up to twice its normal size when it felt threatened. The predator, in theory at least, saw this, got scared, and slunk off. She felt a little like that bug. And it was this whole town, the whole, the total environment, gestalt was maybe even a better word, that made her feel that way. She knew that nobody was going to make her wear a scarlet letter, but she also knew that for her mind to finish convincing her nerves of that fact, a break with a gunquit was necessary. When she went out on the street, she could feel people not looking at her, but getting ready to look at her. The year-round residents, of course, not the summer people, the year-round residents always had to have someone to look at. A tosspot, a welfare slacker, the kid from a good family who had been picked up shoplifting in Portland, or Old Orchard Beach, or the girl with the levitating belly. The second call, the so-so one, had been from Jess Ryder. He had called from Portland, and he had tried the house first. Luckily, he had gotten Peter who gave him Fran's telephone number at the harbor side with no editorial comment. Still, almost the first thing he said was, you got a lot of static at home, huh? Well, I got some, she said cautiously, not wanting to go into it. That would make them conspirators of a kind. Your mother? Why do you say that? She looks like the type that might freak out. It's, it's something in the eyes, Franny. It, it says if you shoot my sacred cows, I'll shoot yours. She was silent. I'm sorry, I didn't want to offend you. You didn't, she said. His description was actually quite apt, surface apt anyway, but she was still trying to get over the surprise of that verb, offend. It was a strange word to hear from him. Maybe there's a postulate here, she thought. When your lover begins to talk about offending you, he's not your lover anymore. Franny, the offer still stands. If you say yes, I can get a couple rings and be there this afternoon. On your bike, she thought, and almost giggled. A giggle would be a horrible, unnecessary thing to do to him, and she covered the phone for a second just to be sure it wasn't going to escape. She had done more weeping and giggling in the last six days than she had done since she was 15 and starting to date. No, Jess, she said, and her voice was quite calm. I mean it, he said with startling vehemence, as if he had seen her struggling with laughter. I know you do, she said, but I'm not ready to get married. I know that about me, Jess. It has nothing to do with you. What about the baby? I'm going to have it. And give it up? I haven't decided. For a moment, he was silent, and he could hear other voices in the other rooms. They had their own problems, she supposed. Baby, the word is a daytime drama. We love our lives, and so we look for the guiding light as we search for tomorrow. I wonder about that baby. Jesse said finally. She really doubted if he did, but it was maybe the only thing he could have said that would cut her. It did. Jess. So where are you going? He asked briskly. You can't stay at the Harborside all summer. If you need a place, I can look around Portland. I've got a place. Where? Or am I supposed to not, um, or am I not supposed to ask? You're not supposed to, she said in bitter tongue for not finding a more diplomatic way of saying it. Oh, he said. His voice was queerly flat. Finally, he said cautiously, can I ask you something and not piss you off, Franny, because I really want to know. It's not a rhetorical question or anything. You could ask, she agreed warily. Mentally, she did gird herself not to be pissed off because when Jess prefaced something like that, it was usually just before he came out with some hideous and totally unaware piece of chauvinism. Don't I have any rights in this at all? Jess asked. Can't I share the responsibility and the decision? For a moment, she was pissed off, and then the feeling was gone. Jess was just being Jess, trying to protect his image of himself to himself, the way all thinking people do, so they can get to sleep at night. 
She had always liked him for his intelligence, but in a situation like this, intelligence could be a bore. People like Jess and herself too had been taught all their lives that the good thing to do was commit and be active. Sometimes you had to hurt yourself and badly to find out it could be better to lie back in the tall weeds and procrastinate. His toils were kind, but they were still toils. He didn't want to let her get away. Jesse, she said, neither of us wanted this baby. We agreed on the pill so the baby wouldn't happen. You don't have any responsibility, but no, Jess, she said quite firmly. He sighed. Will you get in touch when you get settled? I think so. Are you still planning to go back to school? Eventually, I'm going to take the fall semester off, maybe with something CED. If you need me, Franny, you know where I'll be. I'm not running out. I know that, Jesse. If you need dough, yes, get in touch. I won't press you, but I'll want to see you. All right, Jess. Goodbye, friend. Goodbye. When she, sh when she hung up, the goodbyes had seemed too final. The conversation unfinished. It struck her why. They had not added, I love you. And that was a first. It made her sad, and she told herself not to be, but the telling didn't help. That la the last call had come around noon, and it was from her father. They had had lunch the day before yesterday, and he told her he was worried about the effect this was having on Carla. She hadn't come to bed last night. She had spent it in the parlor, poring over the old genealogical records. He had gone in around 11.30 to ask her when she was coming up. Her hair had been down, flowing over the shoulders and the bodice of her nightgown. And Peter said she looked wild and not strictly in touch with things. That heavy book was on her lap and she hadn't even looked up at him only continued to turn the pages. She said she wasn't sleepy. She would be up in a while. She had a cold, Peter told her, as they sat in a booth at the corner lunch, more looking at hamburgers than eating them. The sniffles. When Peter asked her if she would like a glass of hot milk, she didn't answer at all. He had found her yesterday morning asleep in the chair, the book on her lap. When she finally woke up, she had seen better, more herself, but her cold was worse. She dismissed the idea of having Dr. Edmonton in, saying it was just a chest cold. She had put Vicks on her chest and a flannel square cloth, and she thought her sinuses were clearing already. But Peter hadn't cared for the way she looked, he told Franny. Although she refused to let him take her temperature, he thought she was just running a couple degrees of fever. He had called Fran today just after the first thunderstorm had begun. The clouds, purple and black, had piled up silently over the harbor, and the rain began, at first gentle and then torrential. As they talked, she could look out her window and see the lightning stab down at the water beyond the breakwater. And each time it happened, there would be a little scratching noise on the wire, like a phonograph, needle, digging, a record. She's in bed today, Peter said. She finally agreed to let Tom Edmonton take a look at her. Has he been yet? He just left, he thinks she's got the flu. Oh, Lord, Franny said, closing her eyes. That's no joke for a woman her age. No, it isn't, he paused. I told him everything, Franny, about the baby, about your fight that you and Carla had. Tom's taken care of you since you were a baby yourself, and he keeps his lip, his lip buttoned. I wanted you to know that if I could have caused this, he said no. Flu is flu. Flu made who, Fran said bleakly. Pardon? Never mind, Fran said. Her father was amazingly broad-minded, but an ACDC fan, he was not. Go on. Well, there's not much further to go on, Hunt. He said, there's a lot of it around, a particularly nasty breed. It seems to have migrated out of the South and New York is swamped with it. But sleeping in the parlor all night, she began doubtfully. Actually, he said being in an upright position was probably better for our lungs than a bronchial. See, <laughs> this is the problem when I do this accent. I, was, I, I always start, I start going into Boston. It's not Boston, it's Maine. And so it's a little bit different. It's hard to do. So I should probably abandon it, but. Let's keep the Peter. Peter at first didn't realize was the father. All right, you can't get that from here. I need to start doing the sketch from SNL from back in the eighties. You can't get that. Actually, he said being in an upright position was probably better for our lungs and a bronchial tubes. He didn't say anything else. But Alberta Edmonton belongs to all the organizations Carla belongs to, so he didn't have to. Both of us knew he. She's been inviting something like this, friend. She's president of the town historical committee. She's spending twenty hours a week in the library. She's secretary of the women's club and the lovers of literature club. She's been running the march of dimes here in town since before Fred died. 
And last winter, she took on the Hart Fund for good measure. On top of all that, she's been trying to drum up interest in the Southern Maine Genealogical Society. She's run down, worn out. And that's part of the reason she blew up at you. All, all Edmonton says was that she had the welcome mat out for the first evil germ that passed away. That's all he had to say, Franny. She's, she's getting old and she doesn't want to. She's been working harder than I have. How sick is she, Daddy? She's in bed, drinking juice, taking the pills that Tom prescribed. I, I took the day off, and Miss Halliday is going to come in and sit with her tomorrow. She, she wants Miss Halliday so they can work out an agenda for the July meeting of the Historical Society. He sighed windily, and lightning scratched the wire again. I sometimes think she wants to die in this harness. Timidly, Fran said, do you think she'd mind if I... Right, right now, she would. But give it time, Fran. She'll come around. Now, four hours later, tying her rain scarf over her hair, she wondered if her mother would come around. Maybe if she gave up the baby, no one in town would ever get wind of it. <clears throat> that was unlikely, though. In the small towns, people scent the wind with noses of uncommon keenness. I got a small town. This is a fucking great quote. He's got some great fucking quotes, guys. And so I'm going to put that on my Facebook page. If you want to follow me on Facebook, just find Ryan Jeans. Um, You'll probably know which one. It's the guy who's got a public page where he says fuck all the time. That's me. I love that. Here, I'll read that again for you. In small towns, people scent the wind with noses of uncommon keenness. <laughs> scent the wind with noses. That's just a fucking small town. Basically, how I would interpret that is in small towns, everybody knows what's going on. Like, if you're in a small town, you know, that guy, that guy, that guy. I mean, it's a small town. Like, everybody knows... And the drama that's going on in town, you know who they are. You don't need characters on the television. Uh, Stephen King. There you go. That's from his book. But it's always weird when you're trying to quote an author who is writing fiction because it's a beautiful saying that isn't necessarily uttered by the author himself, but the author speaking as another character. So fascinating. In small towns, you know, sorry, this is narrator voice, which is my voice. In small towns, people scent the wind with noses of uncommon keenness. And of course, if she kept the baby, but she wasn't really thinking of that, was she? Was she? She could feel guilt working in her as she pulled on her light coat. Her mother was run down. Of course she was. Fran had seen that when she came back home from college, and the two of them exchanged kisses on the cheek. Carla had bags. I'm going to give you a little aside here when I read this. So j just again to reiterate, the, the stand is about a pandemic. Uh, I guess similar to the one that we're experiencing right now, but uh, they're the kill The kill rate in this story is about 94%. So we have a kill rate with coronavirus at 2% or so. A probability of death. So not even close to what these people are going through with the, and then everybody fucking dies like at once. Like it's just massive. It metastasizes and just wipes out all, but, uh, you know, look out, look outside at a hundred people, like 94 of them gone. So with a hundred people and with what we're dealing with, two of them gone, but still you're going to know you, I, I hate to say this guys, you probably will know somebody when this is all said and done who died of the virus. I mean, it's, it's a fucked up world we live in. So I hope this creates some changes here as society. Carla had bags under her eyes. Her skin looked too yellow. Carla's her mother, by the way. Carla had bags under her eyes. Her skin looked too yellow. And the gray in her hair, which was always beauty shop neat, had progressed visibly in spite of the $30 rinses. But still, she had been hysterical, absolutely hysterical. And Franny was left asking herself exactly how she was going to assess responsibility if her mother's flu developed into pneumonia or if she had some kind of breakdown or even died. God, what an awful thought. That couldn't happen. Please, God, no, of course not. The drug she was taking would knock it out. And once Franny was out of her line of visibility and incubating her little stranger quietly in Summersworth, her mother would recover from the knock she had been forced to take. She would, the phone began to ring. She looked at it blankly for a moment and outside more lightning flickered, followed by a clap of thunder so close and vicious that she jumped, wincing. Jangle, jangle, jangle. But she had had her three calls. Who else could it be? Debbie wouldn't need to call her back and she didn't think Jess would either. Maybe it was dialing for dollars or a salad master salesman, or maybe it was Jess after all, giving it the old college try. As she went to pick it up, 
She felt sure it was her father and that the news would be worse. It's a pie, she told herself. Responsibility is a pie. Some of the responsibility goes with all the charity work she does, but you're only kidding if you think you're not going to have to cut a big, juicy, bitter piece for yourself and eat every bite. Hello? There was nothing but silence for a moment, and then she frowned, puzzled, and said hello again. Then her father said, Fran, and made a strange gulping sound. Franny. That gulping sound again, and Fran realized with dawning horror that her father was fighting back tears. One of her hands crept to her throat and clutched at the knot where the rain scarf was tied. Daddy, what is it? Is it mom? Franny, I'll have to pick you up. I'll just swing by and pick you up. That's what I'll do. Is mom all right? She screamed into the phone. Thunder whacked over the harbor side again and frightened her and she began to cry. Tell me, daddy. She, she got worse. That's all I know, Peter said. About a half hour after I talked to you, she got worse. She, her, her fever went up. She, she started to rave. I tried to get Tom and Rachel said she was out, that a lot of people were really sick. So I called the Sanford Hospital and they said their ambulances were out on calls, both of them, but they'd add Carla to the list. The, the list, Freddie, what the hell is this list? All of a sudden, I don't, I know Jim Warrington. He drives one of the Sanford ambulances and unless there's a car wreck on 95, he sits around and plays gin rummy all day. What's this list? He was nearly screaming, calm down, daddy, calm down, calm down. She burst into tears again and her hand left the knot in her scarf and went to her eyes. If she's still there, you better take take her yourself. No, no, they came about 15 minutes ago in Christ, Franny. There were six people in the back of that ambulance. One of them was Will Ronson, the man who runs the drugstore. And Carla, your mother, she came out of it a little as they put her in and she just kept saying, I can't catch my breath, Peter. I can't catch my breath. Why can't I breathe? Oh, Christ. He finished in a breaking childish voice that frightened her. Can you drive, Daddy? Can you drive over here? Yes, he said. Yes, sure. He seemed to be pulling himself together. I'll be on the front porch. She hung up and went down the stairs quickly, her knees trembling. On the porch, she saw that, although it was still raining, the clouds of this latest thunder shower were already breaking up, and late afternoon sun was beaming through. She looked automatically for the rainbow and saw it far out over the water, a misty and mystic crescent. Guilt gnawed and worried at her furry bodies inside her belly in where that other thing was and she began to cry again eat your pie she told herself as she waited for her father to come it tastes terrible so eat your pie you can have seconds even thirds eat your pie franny eat every bite it's fucking amazing guys i mean that's uh that's some uh i mean that's some good writing i mean whether he wrote it on coke or not to me seems irrelevant i mean a woman dealing with, uh, you know, this is a woman dealing with, uh, uh, how shall we say this, uh, a pregnancy. And to give you a little backstory, this this woman is young. She's college age. And so she's got a college boyfriend. And so the college boyfriend's in Portland, Maine, and, and rides down on his bike to see her and fucks her on the beach and gets her pregnant. And he's not a bad kid. He's just a kid that has a big future ahead of him. And, you know, she was supposed to be on the birth control pill. Well, something went wrong and either she forgot to take it or, or, you know, the, the pill just didn't work. And so he's faced with this choice where, you know, what is he going to do? And his name is uh, Jesse in that, in that scene. And so this kid's going, I don't, you know, what, what the fuck do I do? I mean, I, I just, and she, but he's a good kid in the sense that, he wants to do the right thing, but it's all, it, it's not true. It's, it's not that he wants, he, he wants to absolve himself of guilt. At least that's what I got out of um, Stephen King's uh, writing there, which, which is quite, which is quite fantastic when you think about it. I mean, if you think about being a, um, a 19 year old kid, right. And your, your girlfriend's pregnant and you're white, you're privileged, you're, you're maybe not rich, but, you know, you don't have this sort of shit, man, you know, just as a, as a, as a privileged white kid growing up, 
Uh, and I would work these jobs. I remember working as a waiter in San Antonio, Texas. And, you know, I was college educated. Most of the, you know, I was, I worked a lot of blue collar jobs or just jobs anywhere. Cause I didn't like academia and I didn't like working quite frankly. and just fucking lived as a bohemian and just kind of fucked around quite frankly. And this kid is working with me and he's younger than me. So I'm in my twenties. He's probably like 22. And I find out he's got two kids. Like it was just normal. He was just like, yes, yeah, my son, he's Hispanic, San Antonio. He's got two children, two fucking kids. He's fucking 20, like maybe 22, no college education, but earns enough money. And, you know, he's like, yeah, I got a kid. I got a family. You know, this is kind of, it's, it's just kind of different. I mean, um, I, I don't really, you know, I'm going to speculate a, a little bit. I don't think that's necessarily Hispanic culture. That, that's kind of a socioeconomic thing because when you're poor and you have a kid, it's kind of like, well, the whole fucking clan's going to raise him, right? We're all going to fucking raise this kid. You know, my mom, you know, we're, he's not going to just be, it's not going to be just me. You, you know, you got a community behind you, but as we kind of move up the line, especially people who've been in the United States and we're, we come from a long line of inherited wealth. It's going to prickle some of the, uh, some white people. Are like, I don't have any privilege. Yeah, you do. Everybody has some level Everybody has some level of sustenance or good things in their life that they did not choose, if that makes any sense. So what that means is I'm not telling you that you didn't work hard for the shit that you have, but everybody, you know, you're, you're in a pyramid here. And my friend told me I should write, there you go. Look, it's, <laughs> it's actually coming out that I had to write that backwards. So it would come out correctly here. But I, I guess I have to, uh, here, let me see if I can do the pyramid backwards. Why not? Pyramid. Right? So boom, 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 boom. You got a lot of these people, 50% of humanity. This is your wealth gap. Here's your middle class. Here's your upper middle class. Jeff Bezos is like up here. And then, you know, you got the people up here. So if you're born in here, you didn't earn that. Don't worry. Neither did I. And I'm not telling you that so you go out and just fucking cash out a hundred fucking all your money in hundred dollar bills that your mom gave you, your dad gave you. But you, there were safety nets for these people that these people did not have. That doesn't mean that you, oh, well, it's not my fault. And so, you know, everybody always wants to go to extremes with these things. So, oh, so what do you say? Just start redistributing the wealth. <clears throat> I honestly don't know. What I do know is that. If you're going to tell these people to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, you better tell these motherfuckers too. Otherwise, it's it's not an equitable society. Anyway, getting back on track. So this kid is probably middle class. She she sounds like upper middle class. Like so, when I am seeing this book in my mind, I see especially informed by if you read the whole book, Franny's dad. You know, you, you can tell they're high society. Like her parent. Her mother is very worried about how a potentially pregnant daughter will be seen in her bridge club. So, you know, if you're poor and you say, oh, my daughter got pregnant, that's just like everybody in the fucking community, right? You know, part of this quote unquote high society is having a higher standard. Oh, well, you certainly won't get pregnant unless she's married here in Southern Maine, of course. So that's all, this is all New England. So it's... <clears throat> See, I'm get, I can get, I fade in and out of the accent. I can get it, and then I, I don't have a lot of practice with the manner accent. But anyway, um, but there's a plague, and so her mother is dead. And you can interpret that scene. I, I haven't read ahead of that point, but w what I think happened is in the in the space of those four hours, her mother died. So her mother doesn't want to talk to her because, you know, my daughter's pregnant. Oh my God, you're going to ruin my spot in society in this stupid fucking town. Like, fuck your town, a gun, a gun quit. <clears throat> if, you're, if that's a real town you're from there, I'm not shitting on your town specifically. I'm shitting on the, the society that judges. Like, you know, people get pregnant all the time. Shit happens. You know, live your own life and let people live their own. You know, quit being a judgmental little prick. So, but yeah, his, I would say Stephen King's treatment of going in and out of how, um, 
shall we say, that real life scenario. So the 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 plot that's that's going on, right? So if you look at what's going on, this drives me crazy that this thing. Do I really have to draw backwards for the rest of my life to actually have it show up here? Like I said, I, you see where it says hello gorgeous? I put that on there because I'm writing backwards, but all right, maybe it'll be a good mental exercise. So um you got a you got a major plot going, right? Boom. And that's the plague. P. Oops. I gotta write backwards, huh? Now let's see if I can do that. Let's see here. P L uh A uh G whoops. Uh U it's hard to write. <laughs> Did I get it? Plague! I actually freaking pulled that off. I can't believe it. So you've got a plague, right? The farce. <laughs> I drew that earlier. Yeah. Toilet humor. You got the plague. So that's the big plot line. 